Ladies and gentlemen, here is Randy Gage. Coming up on the weekend, and let me tell you what's going to happen. It's going to start at uh, Greenwich Mean Time or whatever that is there on the International Dateline at midnight, 1, 2, 3, and then around 5.30, 6, 6.30 a.m. in the first time zones, it's going to happen. <laughs> Alarm clocks. Going up, and people are going to be hitting the snooze button, right? And, oh, I just, if I could just get five more minutes to sleep, ten more minutes to sleep, so they'll be hitting the snooze button again. And then a little bit further, it'll move on, and then it's in Auckland, New Zealand, and then it's over to Honolulu, and then it's over to Los Angeles and San Diego and Del Mar and all around here, and then Chicago and Miami and New York, and then it's going to hit over the Atlantic, and it's going to hit the UK, and it's just going to goes all around, right? And what people find is they're going to, you know, the snooze bar, they can't wait anymore. They're going to have to get up. They're going to get in the shower, take this shower really quick. They're going to grab breakfast probably in a drive through window somewhere or maybe in a convenience store. They're going to buy some or they're going to grab a donut. They're going to eat it in traffic while they're stuck in traffic going to a job that we know that most of them don't like or actually hate. And you know what, it's just like here, I mean, look at the traffic outside here tonight. They told me in Auckland it's like that from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Miami, I wouldn't even think of getting on I-95 from 3.30 in the afternoon until 6 o'clock at night. Bogota down there, everywhere in the world you go, this traffic, this congestion. So all these people going into these jobs. Now, what are they doing? They get at this job on Monday, right? Everybody looks forward to Monday, don't they? So they're in this job and they're thinking, if I could just get through the day, if I could just... So they get through the day. What do they do? They go through a drive through somewhere at home, because that's the lament of, of mothers all across the world. Does dinner in a bucket count, right? So they get some kind of dinner, go home, they have this thing, and then they sit in front of the idiot box, the whole family, sitting there rubbing the hair off the back of their head, probably half the guys drinking rancid fermented hops, watching the idiot box. Till they pass out at night, remember, wake up, crawl into bed, and then Tuesday morning, it starts all over again, doesn't it? Into work, again, the job they don't like, extra hate, come home, watch the TV, Wednesday morning, thank goodness, it's hump day, Thursday morning, do the thing, finally get home, and then the next morning, thank goodness, it's Friday. Because you know what Friday means. It means if they can just get through the day, right? They can just get through the day. They know at 5 o'clock that boss is going to say, hey, come in, give up, give up. And, and, and they're, <laughs> and they're going to get that paycheck, right? Which now, of course, that paycheck, it's already gone, Pamela. Because they've got all those little window envelopes in the credit card companies waiting for them. As a matter of fact, the bank is waiting for them because they've got to cover those checks that they kited for the last two days, getting ready to pay those credit cards because now they get paid. But all, they don't think about that at that moment because just for one brief moment, they can pretend that check is theirs. <laughs> And you know what that means. That means it's time to celebrate. And what that means here, of course, in the States is it's off to Pizza Hut. <laughs> All right? For one of those meat lovers, extra meat, double cheese, stuffed crust. But give me a Diet Pepsi because I'm kind of watching my weight. All right? So it's end of the diet. You know, it's in the Pizza Hut thing. And then after Pizza Hut, it's over to the video store. Well, they will. Have you seen a video store at 7 o'clock on a Friday night? Okay, where they will stack up enough videos. I'm talking three, five, six, 
eight videos. They will stack up enough videos so that they can spend the entire weekend watching videos in a coma so they don't have to think of their life of quiet desperation until Monday morning, 6.30, when it starts all over again. The rat race. That's the reality for people out there. They're living in the rat race. Day after day after day after day, week after week after week after week, months turn into years and years turn into lifetimes, into lives of quiet desperation. Tonight we're going to talk about a way to get out of that quiet desperation, to get a life of financial independence, personal independence, true freedom, and more importantly perhaps, a life of meaning and purpose and contribution. Now, why is it, let's explore first, why so many people are in these lives of quiet desperation. I believe there's two causes to that. Cause number one, and this is for the vast majority of people, is because they're in a line of work where they simply do not make enough money. They're in a line of work that they don't enjoy. They're in a line of work without security. Here's the reality right now. The economic system in this world doesn't work. Now, we've got capitalism. Now, I'm the biggest advocate of capitalism there is, the free enterprise system. And we've got all these other failed experiments all around the globe. And you know what? None of them have worked. But somebody once said about the capitalism, it's the worst form of government in the world except for all the rest. And I think that's a pretty accurate description. And I've experienced this, as, as some of you know, I've introduced this business to, in Bulgaria, Slovenia, Croatia, Macedonia. So I've had the opportunity to go into places where they've had socialism for 40 years and been exposed to free enterprise for the very first time. And I've seen what happens when people get the opportunity to control their destiny. Something here in the States we often take for granted. But let me tell you, they don't take for granted in a lot of places around the world as well we should learn from them. But as wonderful as free enterprise is, very few people who have the opportunity to partake of it is doing, are doing that. They're nibbling cheese in the rat race. Here's why I say this economic system doesn't work. If we take a hundred people who graduate from college, can we go down just a little bit on the in-room level there, please? We go to a hundred people who graduate from college and we follow them through their career, through the 45-year plan, because that's what it is, okay? You get a job when you're about 20, you work for 45 years, and then you're supposed to retire and live your golden years on Social Security. What a wonderful concept, huh? Let's look at the reality. If we follow those 100 people, and this is by the government's own statistics, if we follow those 100 people for 45 years later and we check back on them, at the end of 45 years, Gina, of those 100, 96 will be dead or dead broke. 96 out of 100. Of the four left, three of them will be able to meet their needs without charity from their family, their church, the government. They will be self-sustaining. And by that, I do mean self-sustaining. Their idea of an exciting day in their golden years better be to get up and walk their poodle around the block because that's about all they're going to have money to do. Because they can just get, they don't need charity, but they're just getting by. And of the 100, one will be wealthy. That's the real world equation in this system. We've got a university system that teaches you how to be an employee. We have high schools, primary schools, middle schools, even preschools. They will teach you how to be a worker drone in the collective. You all saw that movie, The Matrix? You know, the whole concept of that movie was that all this was just a computer-generated matrix. Nothing was real. Well, I'm here to tell you, that movie is more appropriate than you think. Because if you grew up like when I grew up, what my mother told me is you go to school, get an education, and get a job for a big company. You'll be set for life. 
And that was, I think, if you grew up in my era, that's what you were told. Go to school, get an education. And, the, and it's funny, the two companies she always picked out, she said, get a job for General Motors or IBM. Because you'll have a job for life. Because remember, in those days, IBM, they were proud of the fact they had never laid off anybody. Well, there was an article in the uh, Marin Independent Journal. Here's what happened in a three-year period. IBM reduced his workforce by 122,000 people. AT&T, 83,000. GM, 74,000. The Postal Service, 55,000. Sears, 50,000. Uh, yeah, 50,000. GTE, 17,000. Baxter International, 16,000. Bank of America, Amoco, 12,000 each. Uh, Paul Zane Pilsner, who, Pilsner, who's a Nobel Prize winning economist, says that we are losing 5 hundred thousand jobs a year due to technology. Jobs that'll never be replaced. And this is I've been listening to the trend, you know, the surveys at the end of the year like Challenger, Gray and Christmas, which is a big consulting firm on employment, they were given the figures last year. How many jobs disappeared? It was like five hundred thousand and change. So Pilzer was really right on that. Let me tell you what I think happens as we as we leave the millennium. That number gets higher, not lower. Because of the Internet, because of how fast the world is changing, it'll probably, get, and so many things become automated. Instead of losing 500,000 jobs a year, we'll start losing 700,000 a year, 800,000. A million jobs a year will probably be disappearing, never to be replaced. Now, let me tell you a secret. The jobs that are getting disappearing, the people that are being laid off, these are not the guys working at the steel mill. Those jobs were downsized decades ago. These are not the people working at the shoe factories. Those jobs were downsized sent overseas decades ago, too. Let me tell you who's getting downsized today. Supervisors, managers, mid-level executives. Now, here's what the government tells us. The government tells us the economy is doing great. Thousands of new jobs were created. Inflation's low, non-existent, and thousands of jobs are being created. Well, what's wrong with this picture? See, the jobs being created are jobs like drive through window jobs. The jobs being lost are the mid-level manager jobs. So if you've got someone who is making $60,000 a year as a supervisor and uh, they're taking care of their three kids and they get downsized, it isn't going to do them any good to get a job with a paper hat, is it? they're not going to be able to take care of their family. And that's what I'm telling you. The paper hat jobs are the jobs that are being created today. So the government can give us all these thoughts about how great the economy is. And the reality is, do you work, do you get paid the same amount of, I mean, do you really make, is your dollar that you get worth as much today as it was a year ago? Of course not. Is it worth as much as it was five years ago? <laughs> not even close. Ten years ago? Inflation, which they tell you is non-existent, of course, that's not true at all. We know we pay a lot more to get the same things today than we did a couple of years ago. And that's going to continue to operate that way. So this economy of 96 out of 100 people, I mean, did they tell you that when you applied for your job? When you got out of college, did they tell you that in college? Listen, here's the deal. If you go to school, get an education, you're going to be able to get a job. And 96% guaranteed you're going to end up dead or dead broke. <laughs> did they tell you that in your interview? Did they forget that again? They always seem to forget that. I don't know why that. When you go to those interviews, they, Gary, they always seem to forget that, don't they? See, that's the real, that, that, that system, and it works for most people because they're trapped in the rat race. They don't have enough money. They are living paycheck to paycheck. Here's another thing from the USA Today. Most reject, they're talking about, they ask people, how would you like to live to 100? Now, me, I don't want to live to 100 because that's, too short. I'm looking for at least 125. <laughs> but they asked these people, they did a big survey, who wants to live to 100? The AARP did the survey. 68, no, 63% said, no, I don't want to live that long. 63%. So they asked them, why don't you want to live that long? 46% feared declining health. And 38% worry because they won't have enough money to live that long. What's up with that? Could you imagine being willing to give away your life? 
who's saying, hey, I don't want to hang on because I'm not going to have enough money to make it. That economy is broken. It doesn't work. That's cause number one. Let me tell you what's cause number two of all these people who are regretting the fact that their alarm clocks are going off. Now, first of all, I mean, think about this. Is that the dumbest invention you ever heard of in your life, an alarm clock? I mean, think about it. It's got to be the most unnecessary, stupid, idiotic invention ever done. Do you know when you're supposed to wake up, Debbie? When you finish sleeping. <laughs> That's when you're supposed to wake up. So what is this alarm? Why are people... So let me tell you, cause number two, why people are so nervous when these alarm clocks going off. And cause number two is, is what Eric Butterworth calls divine dissatisfaction. In other words, these people, and some of you listening to the tape are in this category, some of you are in the first category, some of you tonight are in the first, some of you are in the second category. The second category is people who are making good incomes. They have good titles. They have, quote, good jobs. But they're not happy because they're not contributing. They don't have meaning in their life. In other words, they may be a doctor who's working, got a beeper going off 24 hours a day, and then they, if they check someone into the hospital, there's a committee that overview, oversees that. And then if they prescribe prescription drugs to those people, there's a committee oversees that. If they take them off the drugs, there's a committee oversees that. When they check them, if they don't check them out of the hospital in time, they say, hey, that lady had the baby yesterday. What's she still doing in the hospital today? Get her out of here. So they got committed. And then HMOs and PPOs and managed care and malpractice insurance. And all of a sudden, you know what? This doesn't look so fun anymore. So they may be a school teacher who got into business because they love to teach kids. And now they spend their day worrying about running the metal detectors and cafeteria duty and everything except what they wanted to do, which was to teach and mold to help develop young minds. See, so... They have this divine dissatisfaction, meaning because they know in their heart of hearts that they could do more. They could be more. And though they got a nice title or a nice job or a corner office or they get to wear a suit, they got a fancy car, they got a nice house, they got a country club membership, they have all the toys, but they don't have the fulfillment. So we're going to talk, whichever one of those categories you're in, we're going to show you this business tonight that will help you in either event. Because, yes, it can give you financial freedom back. And if you already got the money thing out of the way, we can show you how you can contribute. Because we've got a business. You're going to choose the hours that you work. You're going to pick the people that you work with. You can start a part-time with whatever you're doing right now. There's great travel opportunities. If you like to travel, many you can travel all over the country or all over the world. Tax benefits are incredible. You can save average five, ten thousand dollars a year, whatever you're making your regular job. You can bring that down to the bottom line as profit in most countries because of the kind of tax benefits that you can get by having an at-home business. And then two other uh, benefits I think just stand head and shoulders above all that. And the first of them is the fact that you can get rich quick. Now, <laughs> see you laughing? Now, why do I say get rich quick? Because don't we always say, we should never say get rich quick. Well, let me tell you why I say get rich quick. Because what we're going to show you tonight is a business that you can start part-time, seven to ten hours a week, and you can be wealthy in two to four years. And let me tell you a secret. That's quick. <laughs> Let me tell you a secret. That's quick. Because if you look at what your job, you know, you can double your income in two years in this business. You can triple your income in two years in this business. I don't know too many jobs and businesses outside of this one where you can say that. I don't know. You know, I know people who are doctors. I know people who are lawyers. I know people who own gas stations, own small businesses. Are they consultants? And you know what? They don't make a year what I make in a month. 
And understand something. I'm coming as a former dishwasher from Mr. C's Pancake and Steakhouse on Midvale Boulevard in Madison, Wisconsin. <laughs> the other relevant factor is I'm a high school dropout. And I say dropout, now that wasn't voluntary. I was invited to leave, you understand. <laughs> And even when I was there, I was in the half of the class that made the top half possible, if you know what I mean. Okay? So it's not like, yet I became a multimillionaire. Okay? My dreams came true. I didn't have the degrees. I didn't have the connection. I, see, I wasn't one of those people with divine dissatisfaction. I was one of those people who always had to worry about pay, uh, paying the rent. I was one of those people who had to buy gas a dollar at a time. And when I say a dollar at a time, I mean that was with two rolls of pennies. Because <laughs> we had dug deep, deep, deep. We had rolled up everything we could roll up, and it was get one dollar to buy gasoline. I sold all my furniture. I slept on the floor. I did that thing. I did that at 30 years old. Those of you who know my story know that at 30 years old, I had lost everything. And you sell this, and you sell that, and you keep the TV to last. Okay. <laughs> You do. You get rid of the bed before you get rid of the TV. So I was sleeping on the floor because I kept the TV because I needed, because I was so upset, so crazy, so sick, so disgusted, so depressed, I didn't want to think about my life. So I watched TV 12 hours a day. The minute I came home, I watched TV, and I watched infomercials till 4.30 a.m., 5 a.m., because I couldn't sleep. Because I was thinking of all the money I owed and all the problems I had and everything. So I watched infomercials, trying to figure out how to get rich. If I just had the sixty nine ninety five to buy that real estate course, I could have been rich. You know? Let me tell you my favorite. My favorite was a guy, I haven't seen him, I don't know what happened to him. It was a Vietnamese guy named Tom Vu. Remember him? Oh man, what a commercial. He'd watch it and he'd say, and he'd get right in your face. He'd, he had this thing, he was standing in front of his Ferrari Testarossa, next to his fountain in front of his mansion. And he'd say, You, you are a loser! It's 3 a.m., you're watching TV, your wife's asleep, your baby's asleep, you're a loser. Nobody cares about you. Nobody cares about you. If you don't buy my program, you deserve to be broke. <laughs> and then he'd jump in that Ferrari and he'd peel off spinning the rubber tires on it. I'd be like, oh, man, if I just had that $199, if I just, you know, just go crazy. So finally, I had to sell the TV. So I didn't even have the TV left. So I couldn't even watch infomercials. So I discerned, I, you know, I discerned something that if I didn't change my life, if I didn't change the way I looked, if I didn't change the things I do every day, it wasn't going to happen. The other thing you need to know is not, uh, I, it wasn't correct to say I was broke, because I wasn't. See, I would have needed to get $55,000 just to qualify for broke, because okay? I owed that much money. I was that much in debt. So you look at that kind of debt, and I said, well, geez, I could go back to working in the restaurant business. I could get eight bucks an hour if I'm willing to flip eggs, which is what I did, by the way. I went and took a job flipping eggs for eight bucks an hour, because that was the first place that told me they'd pay me at the end of the week and they'd cash the check and give me the, the money at that Friday. So I flipped eggs. And I thought, well, geez, you know, 40 hours, time, you know, how long is it going to take me to make $55,000 back? <laughs> it didn't look too promising. That's when I said, you know what, I need to look at network marketing again, because I don't know how else I could make back that kind of money and get where I need to get. And I don't want to make back 55000 so I can qualify to be broke. I want to drive nice cars. I want to live in a nice place. I want to live on the water. I, wanna, I, wanna, I don't want to have to read menus in Chinese, you know, where you've got to read from the right to the left, because it's kind of a joke here, see? The, see, the, the price is on the right, the, you know, okay. <laughs> Some of these are like joke grenades. <laughs> I'll pull the pin first and you'll get it. <laughs> I can play it. 
See, I don't want to live like that anymore. I want to tell you know, and I want to contribute. You know, if people give money such a bad rap, people think you hear money is evil. Money, you know, they just care about money. Let me tell you my take on all this. My take on all this is that money is wonderful. That money is God in action. That you build churches with money. You help people with money. You get your self-respect with money because you're able to earn your living and take care of your family. You don't have to be laying awake at three at night watching some idiotic infomercial wondering how you're going to get enough money to, to pay the rent this month. You know, I did that thing. I don't want to do that again. When I lost everything, one of the things I did is I began a study of prosperity and wealthy people. And when I say prosperity, I mean in every sense of the word. I look for people who were healthy, happy, had good relationships, drove nice cars, wore nice clothes, lived in beautiful homes, went on vacations, you know, to real places. You know, like when I grew up, I told you I was raised in Madison, Wisconsin. You know, every, now I had a single mother who raised three kids by herself. And let me tell you, for vacation every year, we could go anywhere we wanted as long as it was Wisconsin Dells. <laughs> you know, I see people like that in Miami. Same thing. They can go anywhere they want as long as it's south of Disney World. Year after year after year. Well, you know, I know kids. They went to Paris. They went to Africa. They went to places like that. I never even, you know, dreamed of going to places like that in those days. But now, at 30 years old, when I really looked at my life again, I said, you know, there's, there's more than this. I want to be a part of this. And I got into network marketing. So one of these things we can do is we can help. We have this unlimited income potential. And this is why I say you talk about benefits of the business. One of the biggest ones is the fact that we have this unlimited income potential. And the second thing we get that you don't find anywhere else is the ability to become successful while you're helping other people reach success. And let me tell you, you know, Shirley was kind enough to say I'm her mentor. And I have people, Dan and Nance and, and Dix and people who say, yeah, I, thanks, Randy. I got this out of your book or I got that out of your tape album. People that I sponsored into the business. People I sponsored into the business eight years ago that I hear from. I don't hear from for years and then I hear from that they broke through. People who, who started out in a basement on welfare, raising their kids, who, who make $30,000 a month now. You know what, $30,000 a month, that's wonderful. And I'm really happy for my friend who makes this $30,000 a month, but even more happy I am for the self-respect it gave her because she refused to be a victim. She said, hey, I've been dealt a bad hand, but I'm not going to accept the bad hand. And she went out and she built the business and she set that example for her kids. And they're going to grow up knowing what, how proud they should be of their mother because of what she's accomplished. That's what we do in this business. We give people their freedom back. We give them their self-respect back. Most encompassing of all that, we give people their dreams back. Here's what I know about dreams. I know, for those of you who know my story, know I had a lot of problems as a kid. I, I was in a jail cell at 15 years old. And I got out of that jail cell and became a contributing member of this planet because of a teacher who came to see me and said, you know, you're better than this. I see big things for you. I know what you could accomplish. And nobody had ever told me that. My whole life, nobody had ever said anything like that to me. You know what they said to me? You know what I heard a thousand times if I heard it once was, how could somebody so smart be so stupid? If I heard that once, I heard it a thousand or ten thousand times. How could that's all that? So here's this one guy who never even knew me, a parent of a of a girl I went to school with, who pulled my file, looked at me, came in and said, "No, you're capable of so much more. You, I see great things from you." That was the first person who turned my life around. The second person was the one who sponsored me into network marketing, who I dedicated my book to who showed me this bigger vision, got me reading books like The Magic of Thinking Big, The Power of Positive Thinking, Think and Grow Rich. And I started to feed my mind. And you know what? It opened up this whole big, big, big window of what was possible. That wasn't that the dream became instead of how to make $300 a week to go to $350 a week, 
the dream became, why not $3,500 a week? And then when it got there, the dream became, why not $35,000 a week? Now, understand, nobody in my family had ever made half that much in an entire year. My kid sister was the first person in my family who ever went to college. We didn't think that way in my family. The person who brought me into this business, they introduced me to materials that got me thinking that way. We get stuck in our rut so complacent, so in the box, we just don't even look outside. Well, so I told you, I started in a jail cell. One of the things I do now is I go and talk to kids in jail, in foster homes, schools, places like that. You know, there's, I've got some very dear friends up in Oregon who, who run a uh, foster home. They've had about 350 foster kids uh, over the course of the years. Wonderful, just just angels, these people. And these kids are the, the forgotten kids of society. They're incest victims. Their parents blew each other away. Their parents are in crack houses. They were homeless on the street. The, the kids no one else will adopt or they come to their foster house. So every time I get up in the Northwest, I always try and go take the kids to dinner, do stuff. I send some of them to martial arts training and things like that, trying to get them plugged into stuff. And you know what I find? These kids who have, and I mean, I, I was there, the last time I was there, they had brothers who had been incested by their mother and then taken to a crack house and sold. They were sold in the crack house, right? They were there for months before the authorities finally got them out of there put them in, send them to, their, to these guys' house. And do you know those kids still had dreams? They still had dreams, man. They knew I had a Viper, and they'd, oh, you got a Viper, that car's so cool. Man, when I grow up, I'm buying a Mustang GT, or I'm getting to this, and they all were, they still had dreams. And you see that with kids. They're so resilient. They have to, every kid just knows when they grow up, they're going to be an astronaut, or a rock star, or president, or an NBA star, or whatever. And what happens along the way? They get out of high school and or college, and they take a job. Is it their dream job? No. It's a job they take to pay the bill. Well, honey, it's not my dream job, but it'll give us some money for right now, and we'll get our dream job later. And then pretty soon, another job comes along, pays a little more, so they pay. And it still isn't the dream job, but it's paying a little more than the last one. So the dream gets pushed back a little bit more. Maybe they meet someone along the way. Na, 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 na. All right, and now all of a sudden, now there's a couple little hungry mouths to feed and pampers to buy and braces to pay for and uh, piano lessons. And all of a sudden, we'll live our dreams later. And then a job offer comes up and it means moving to Cleveland, which they don't want to move. But, geez, it's an extra $4,000 a year and we need the money, honey, so there we go. And what happens when they buy a house? They buy the house if they can afford it. They get one. Otherwise, they get, is it their dream house? No, it's the house they can afford what about their car? You know, I was looking and they had in the paper about the 10 best-selling cars. Now, I looked at the list and every single one of them was a broke mobile. <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean. Camrys, Accords, cars made for broke people. It was like Camrys, Accords, Geo, Metro, Ford, Escort. Right? So, now here's the thing. If we've got a bunch of 16-year-old kids together and say, okay, listen, you're growing up soon, you're going to be able to get your own car, what's your dream car? How many of you think we're going to say Ford Escort? <laughs> now, why is that? But how come Escort is one of the top 10 selling cars in America? Now, if you ask me, dream, well, I got my dream cars, but ask the average person their dream car, what are they going to say? Vipers, Lamborghinis, Testarossas. Uh, Rolls Royce, you know, Lexus. What? So why is everybody buying neons? Because they gave up on their dreams. Well, honey, we, we could make the payments. We could get it financed. We can drive out here. It's got a back seat for the kids. So they take what they can take. You know, I know it's funny. I'll be out driving around in my NSX or one of my Vipers. I'll be at a light. Car will pull up next to me, and the kids will be hanging out the window. Hey, Mr. Viper, cool car, man. The kids are just crazy about that, right? Now, Dad ain't doing that. Dad, he's just sitting behind the wheel. <laughs> now, why ain't he doing that? Because see, to the kids, they say, hey, man, when I grow up, I'm going to get a Viper just like you. But see, Dad ain't saying that because he's already grown up. And he's, it's already dawned on him. He isn't going to get a Viper when he grows up. 
He's going to be driving that beat-up Escort for another three and a half years till the lease expires. He'll be like, I used to be driving one of those two-tone jobs, you know, blue on the top, rust on the bottom. Four-door cars, only three of them open up. I mean, that's the reality out there. So what, what happens? Somewhere along the way, people give up on their dreams. 30, 35, 45, somewhere along the way, they just kind of die. And they say, that's the way it is. Be realistic. This is what people are going to tell you. You get involved in this business, let me tell you what your friends are going to tell you. That stuff don't work. You've got to have money to make money. You've got to get in at the top. That's all a pyramid scheme. Oh, you're going to get ripped off. Oh, you're going to the cleaners. Oh, that stuff don't work. Oh, yeah, if you would have got in 20 years ago, man, it really worked, but you can't do that today. <sighs> Let me tell you, if you're like me, what you do when you're, when you're in that lack and limitation program, you surround yourself with people who give you permission to stay the way you are. And in my case, because I was one of these victims, I surrounded myself with victim friends. See, so, because what do we do? We, we surround ourselves with victims because we want people to feel sorry for us. And let me tell you, lots of people felt sorry for me. I mean, we know already I've been in jail. I've been expelled from high school. I've had my business seized by the IRS. I've been shot in a robbery. Had about 12 dysfunctional relationships, one after the other, after the other, after the other. You know what I mean? The name changed, the face changed, but it was the same person. <laughs> yeah. They just kept getting plastic surgery and coming back, you know, sneaking in again. Twelve in a row, negative relationship after that. So I'd get together with all my victim friends. They'd tell me their tragedy. Oh, yeah, what about me? I'm getting, you know, my, the electric company cut off my power. My friend is telling me, oh, he's getting evicted from his place. So they'd tell you their tragedy, you tell them their. And then don't you hate it when they got a better tragedy than you do? <laughs> I mean, nothing makes you mad, right? So then when they'd have a better tragedy than me, I'd have to go out and manifest a worse tragedy, right? So you're going to go home, you're going to manifest a tumor, a meteorite landed on your garage, something, because you can't have your victim friends having a better tragedy than you. So this is what I did for 30 years. And all of a sudden, I decided I didn't want to be a victim anymore. And that's when I got back in this business and started building this business. At 30 years old, after I was tired of sleeping on the floor, had no house, no car, no job, no credit cards, and owed 55000 bucks. And I said, you know what? I don't want to be a victim anymore. I want to be a victor. Now, what do you think happened with my friends? They all said, great, Randy, we love it. We're with you all the way. We want to be a victor, too. <laughs> oh, you got the same friends? <laughs> yeah, let me tell you what they can do. They've got to try and pull you down. They've got to tell you all those things I told you. Because they're not ready to leave being a victim. They're not willing to let go of that because it's who they are. It's how they define themselves. It's how they get attention, which they translate as receiving love. But that's all they know. So, you're serious? You're going to have to disregard all that. It's going to have to start with you. See, that's what it did with me. I looked at wealthy people and I said, all right, I'm going to start studying prosperity. So I started reading The Dynamic Laws of Prosperity by Catherine Ponder, Prosperity by Charles Fillmore, started going to church started reading books like The Magic of Thinking Big, Think and Grow Rich, all of those things, as a man thinketh. started programming my mind with that. And I looked at how wealthy people became wealthy. And two things I really boiled it down to, and I think they're the essence of this business of network marketing. Number one, prosperity principle number one that you've got to do is, number one, you've got to be your own boss. You will never get wealthy working for anyone else. If you have a job, they're going to buy you at wholesale and they're going to sell you at retail. That's just the way it has to work because they have to make money too. The corporation, the dry cleaner, the restaurant, whatever the entity is that hires you has to make a profit on you. They have to buy you at $18,000 a year and sell you at uh, $36,000 a year. So, you know, one in a million, they're going to get a job and they're going to get wealthy. But one in a million, you got a better shot of hitting the lotto than you got to get wealthy working for someone else. So that was principle number one. You need to be your own boss. And in this business, you will be your own boss. But you'll be your own boss with the support of a multi-million dollar corporation behind you and all the training, expertise, guidance of all your entire sponsorship line, every single one of which has a vested interest in helping you build your business. But you're still your own boss. 
But that's not enough. See, I became my own boss. You know, I told you, I started as a dishwasher. I worked hard, they made me a cook. I worked hard, they made me a waiter. Then I became a manager trainee. So I got a new dream, Marlene. My dream was to become a restaurant manager. Okay? Well, hey, coming from where I came from, that was a big dream then. I thought, I'll be wearing a tie. Go around with the coffee pot. Hi, how's your dinner this evening? Everything okay? I mean, what more could he ask for for this? This was the big time. Until I got it. Then let me tell you what that turned into. That turns into becoming a good manager. Wanted to make good money, make good profit, do a good job for the chain. So I'd get raises, get promoted. So I did that. And you know what they said? We got another store. They're losing money. We need to send you over there. So I went to the other store, and I turned that around. They started making money. I said, Randy, we're going to make you the problem store manager. We're going to send you. We got a store losing money. We're going to send you there. And that's what they did. I'd go to a store, turn it around, put it in the black, and they'd send me to the next store. In five years, I lived in 18 cities. So you can imagine I had a wonderful life with lots of close friends and social life. <laughs> Talking about raising a family, I couldn't raise a house plant with the schedule that I had. <laughs> so here I go, I got all these, you know, they kept giving me, you know, little raises here and there and stuff. But you know what? I still wasn't wealthy. I still didn't own my own life. So I said, I know the problem. The problem is I need to own my own restaurant. That's the American dream. <laughs> so that's what I did. I worked hard. Yeah, you figured it out. That's where the 55000 in debt came from. <laughs> Oh, she's a smart one. <laughs> yeah, that's why I saved up work. I didn't have enough money, but me and my partner, we bootstrapped it as best we could, bought a place, leveraged it, got credit for that, worked hard, worked 20 hours a day. So I went from working 20 hours a day working for someone to working 24 hours a day for my employees, my vendors, and the government. Until finally the IRS came in and seized my business when I was 30 years old because I couldn't pay the taxes. And started all over again. So let me tell you a secret. Uh, being your own boss isn't just enough. Because if it's a traditional small business in this country, you don't own the business. The business owns you. I have a friend, a guy, as a matter of fact, who was my partner in the first pizzeria I did. I saw him a few years ago. He had just opened a brand new yogurt store built in a shopping mall, you know, with all the new equipment. He's had about 80000 bucks in there with all the equipment and this tile floor and everything. And he said, Randy, just come in and I'll give you half of it. Just be my partner. Help me run the place and I'll give you 50% of it. I said, Michael, there ain't a chance in this world that I would take half of this store for free. Because, see, if I did take half of that store for free, I know that I'd be the one the police call at 3.30 a.m. when the alarm is going off. I'd be the one that the employees would call at 6.30 in the morning because they're going to be sick that day or they got a flat tire going in. And I didn't want that stuff. A traditional business in this country, you don't own the business, the business owns you. You don't believe me? You got subways out here? Of course you do. You got subways. I was in uh, Sydney, Australia. They got subways there. I was in Slovenia. Everywhere I go, they got subways. Let me tell you what it's like in Miami. I got my little house, you know, my condo where I live in. I can go, within five minutes, I can probably get to seven different subways within five minutes of where I live. And nine times out of ten, you can go in one, and this isn't just so, I'm not picking on them, but most of these franchises, you can, which you need 30, 50, 80, 100, 250,000, you buy a McDonald's, you need about a million dollars to, to buy that. But the truth is, those people who buy franchises usually make a profit. It's a safer way to, to make a business. I also know, however, if I go into the average franchise by my, in the daytime hours from nine to five, Chances are very good that when I walk in, the owner will be behind the counter saying, yes, can I be to help you, please? <laughs> and what will he or she have done? They will have paid thirty, fifty, eighty, one hundred fifty, two hundred fifty thousand dollars $150,000 to buy themselves a minimum wage job, which is what I did when I owned my business because I made less than my cooks did. And you know what? They went home after 40 hours. I didn't go home after 80 hours. I was still there. The thing with franchises, you see, I would have been much better if I would have bought a Pizza Hut franchise instead of open my own pizzeria. But see, I didn't have the money for a Pizza Hut franchise. The other thing you can do to be successful, of course, you can have your money work for you. You know, they say, but see, like stocks, if you go to a stock broker, they say, if you don't have $25,000 cash money that you can afford to lose, then don't buy stocks. 
Well, I didn't have $25,000 I could afford to lose. I didn't have $25 I could afford to lose. <laughs> See, so what we've got here is an opportunity where you can go into business, be your own boss, and you don't need a big investment. You can do this with a, a few hundred dollars, up to $1,000. You don't need more than $1,000. Usually 300 to 1000 bucks you're in business. And you can do it in stages, if, like I had to do. I didn't have 1000 bucks when I came in. I had to borrow the 300 to get started. But I got started, and I did it in stages. So that's prosperity principle number one. And prosperity principle number two, and this is big, is you've got to put the concept of leverage to work for you. Because, see, everything else, working, jobs, owning a traditional small business, all those other things, they have one fatal flaw. They're all part of the trading time for money trap. You work eight hours, you get paid for eight hours. You're sick for half a day, you get paid for four hours. You're sick for a whole day, you get paid for zero hours. If you're not there working, it's linear income. If you're not there doing the job, you don't get paid. What we can do in this business is we got leverage. So you start in the business and you find five key people. And you work with the five and you teach them a duplicatable system. You teach them how to follow the same process. And they each worked with five. You'd have 25 on the second level, wouldn't you? So you'd have 30 people. Now, we know it doesn't work out exactly this way. Some do more. Some do less. But just so you see that the concept of it. Because if the five who got five, the 25, if they worked with just three people each, there'd be 75 more people, weren't they? If they worked with threes, then you'd have 225. And you see the organization grows that way, getting wider and wider as it goes deeper and deeper. And it, again, it won't work out exactly 525, 125, 625, all that, but you will see leverage. So you might have someone who gets in the business, starts with three or four key people, and six months into the business, they have 87 people in their group. And if everybody just produced a volume of, let's say, $100 a month. 87 people, they'd have $8,700 they'd get paid on. Let's suppose a year down the road, there was 200 people in the group. If everybody just produced a volume of $100 a month, 200 people times 100 bucks is, what, 20,000 bucks you'd get paid on. So you see, you get paid leverage, which is what J. Paul Getty, one of the wealthiest men the world has ever known, he understood this when he said, I'd rather have 1% of the efforts of 100 people than 100% of my own efforts. This network marketing thing, it's amazing. But I've got to tell you, it won't mean anything if you don't get in touch with your dreams. What I'd like to suggest you think about is five things you would do, have, or become if money was no object. I mean, would you buy a, a Lamborghini Countach? Black with leather seats? Would you give a million dollars to your church? Maybe you'd take two years off and study ballet. Maybe you'd uh, go down and work uh, with people in South America. Maybe you'd uh, buy a new house. How many people here would like a new house? Yeah. How many, ladies, let me ask you this. How many of you would just settle for bigger closets? <laughs> yes. I mean, there's a lot of neat things you can do with money. Money is not a bad thing. For Money gives you freedom. Gives you choices. But you've got to have the dreams that you never see. Because I told you, it's seven to ten hours a week for two to four years. Let me tell you a secret. If you don't know what your dreams are, you will never find the seven to ten hours a week. You will always be like me. When I looked at this business, I thought, I'm too busy for this. I'm working the restaurant business. I work 70, 80, even 90 hours a week sometimes. So I thought, I'll never have time to do this. But the more I looked at it, the more I realized I was busy, but I was busy being broke. All those years I worked in restaurants, even when I own restaurants, even when I manage restaurants, you know what? I never could buy a new car. Never had a new car until I was in my 30s. And I could never afford to pay my taxes. I used to have to borrow money to pay my taxes every year. So I was busy, but I was busy being broke. And I understood if I didn't find the 7 to 10 hours a week somewhere to do this business, I'd be busy being broke for the rest of my life. So please think of maybe it's just homeschooling your kids. Maybe it's just that you're at home when the kids come home from work. I don't know what your dreams are, but please think of them. Five things. You, you know, really, if money was no if you had Bill Gates' kind of money, would you be driving the car you drove in today? Would you be living in the house you're living in today? 
Would you be spending the amount of free time that you spent today? Would you be contributing to your church, temple, synagogue the way you are now if money really was no object? Because if the answer is no, you'd be doing more, having more, being more, then please look at this business. Look, get with the person who gave you this tape or invited you here tonight and really look at, check this out. You can be skeptical. Let me tell you, network marketing, it'll survive a healthy skepticism. This business is now an $80 billion a year annual plus business, over $80 billion a year right now. Practiced in almost 100 countries and territories around the world. Success Magazine called it the most powerful way to reach consumers. It's got positive re profiles and articles in the New York Times in the last couple of years, the Wall Street Journal, Fortune, Forbes, Success Magazine. See, because this is a distribution revolution. We're going to talk about that in just a sec, what we're doing and the, and the trends that are, are, that are taking place here. But you've got to know that this is the real deal. You say, well, but I've heard about pyramids and chain letters. Let me tell you something. Yeah, there were pyramids and chain letters. And you know what? As long as there are people looking for something for nothing, there will always be pyramids and chain letters. But that's not what this business is about. This business is about a new mode of distribution about cutting out all the wasted parasites who normally handle the distribution process, putting the consumer in charge here, and letting the money go to the people who are actually doing the work. It's a whole new paradigm in business and personal development. I mean, think how it used to be. Here's Because I want to talk about trends. Because we know the way to become wealthy, I mean really wealthy, not little money, I'm not even millionaires, I'm talking about billionaires, is to capitalize on trends. Industrial revolution, agricultural revolution. People who foresaw these things became very wealthy. I mean, look at all the old money in this country. Chrysler, Carnegie, Ford, all those people. They made their money in the industrial revolution, industrial revolution businesses. See, they saw this trend. Well, what are the trends going on right now? At-home businesses, one of the biggest trends in the world. Every 10 seconds, somebody opens a home-based business. 10 seconds. Every single 10 seconds. Do you know how many home-based businesses open since we've been talking just here today? Do you have any idea? Every 10 seconds. Let me tell you where else is going. Shop at home. People are busy. They're working jobs. They're overtime. They're commuting. They're fighting traffic. Take the kids to soccer practice. Pay the bill. Pick up the dry cleaning. Try and relax a little bit. They don't have time for shopping. They're looking to buy on the Internet. They're looking to buy on the phone. Pick, give a credit card. Get stuff delivered. So here's two trends. Work at home. Shop at home. This is business position to capitalize on both of those. And the third trend, the distribution revolution that we're taking place in the world right now. You know how it used to be? You had a manufacturer. They made this product. They'd sell it to a rack jobber who'd buy it, resell it to a wholesaler who'd buy it, resell it to a retail operation who might put it in a warehouse or some kind of central shipping facility. And then they'd send it to the store and somebody would, you'd go in the store and you'd buy the product at the store. Five, six, seven levels of product we go through. Well, you know what? That made sense. The years and years ago when stuff was made in England, sent on a ship over to the United States, they docked on the eastern seaboard, and then it went across the country by stagecoach, and then by rail, and then by truck. You know, that made sense then. But it doesn't make sense today. See, nowadays, a network marketing company can manufacture a product and ship it direct to their distributor, who in many cases is the end consumer, and in other cases is just conversationally marketing the product with their friends, neighbors, or relatives. And we eliminate the rack job of the wholesale. All those people, all those parasites that used to be necessary, they're no longer necessary. So what this does is this frees up a lot of money. And I want to talk about this money because people look at the kind of income that I make. The kind of income you make. The kind of income you make. They say, how can that be? How can people make that kind of money? This must be immoral. It must be illegal. At least it must be fattening. I mean, something, right? How can a guy like that make more money in a month than most people make in a year? Or I make more in a month than anyone in my family has ever made in two, three, four years. Ever. Right? How does that happen? Because we take all of that money that used to get wasted in the distribution process, and network marketing companies can take that and put it into two areas. Number one, product research and development. You will see some of the most cutting-edge, state-of-the-art products that never made it to the marketplace any other way will get to the market through network marketing because they've got the money to put into development and they've got the distributor force who become advocates of products that may not be well known. And this room is a perfect example. And the second thing they can do with all that money that they freed up in the distribution 
uh, new paradigm of distribution is they can give it to you, the people who are actually doing the work. Two to four years, you can be wealthy. Look at the new wealth today, the new billionaires, Bill Gates, Michael Dell, Ross Perot. See, none of these people made their wealth in industrial revolution businesses, did they? No, not, none of the billionaires today are coming from industrial revolution businesses because that trend is over. There's a new trend. See, what does Michael Dell do? Here's the perfect example. I'm looking, I'm reading about Michael Dell one time, and they say he's worth four point something billion dollars, right? Four billion dollars. Eight months later, I'm reading the Forbes richest 500, right? The guy's worth ten billion dollars, Jane. Now, in eight months, he went from four billion to ten billion. Now, you probably say, big deal, it's just six billion dollars, right? <laughs> But think of it, eight months. Six. Now what? Because he does what we do in this room. He tell you, what's their model? Be direct. He has a product. People pick up the phone, dial an 800 number, order a computer, or they get online, www, get on Dell, they order a computer, and two days later or one day later, later FedEx is there. See, that old model of distribution, it made sense 100 years ago. But see, 100 years ago, they didn't have fax lines, they didn't have toll-free phone lines, they didn't have credit cards, they didn't have the Internet. We've got all those things today. The Internet is revolutionizing the world. It's not the opportunity of a lifetime. It's the opportunity of a hundred lifetimes. Let me tell you something about the Internet. The Internet is bigger than the Industrial Revolution, the Agricultural Revolution, the wheel, the telephone, the satellite, the television, all rolled into one. The Internet is going to change your life more than all of those things combined. Entire industries like stockbrokers, travel agencies, they're going to disappear or they're going to have to completely reconfigure everything that they do. Branding will completely be revolutionized. The Internet makes the entire world a tiny little village. And it allows the consumer to control what he or she gets and get, get it right away. And network marketing is one of the pioneers in the Internet, allowing we've already built this distribution model to begin with. The Internet is just the technology that we're using to make it easier to get the product or service to the end person. And you're going to see over the next couple of years, it's going to get more and more and more entwined in that. My friends, if you want to really be wealthy, you've got to watch the trends. You've got to capitalize on them. There's no bigger trend than what's going on right now, this distribution revolution. That's why those department stores are in bankruptcies. That's why you see those mega warehouses, even those. I mean, everything in retail has changed. The whole buying distribution process has changed because of this revolution. $80 billion a year industry, 100 countries going in. I'm telling you, network marketing is the field to be in. You want to ride the trends. You want to become wealthy. And you want to do it in the right way, helping people pick the hours, choose the people you work with. We got it all here. But let's go back to what you've got to do to make it happen. To see, those of you know, I'm here tonight even though I retired. You all know that I was that guy who was that dishwasher in that pancake house who became a multimillionaire. And I'm very blessed for that. Every day I wake up, I thank God for all the wonderful benefits I got. But let me tell you why I kept building. And let me tell you why I'm here tonight talking to you guys and putting these words on tape. Because you get to a point in your life where you want to move from money to meaning, from receiving to contribution, to pay back what you've been blessed with. Now, I've been blessed in incredible ways. I live in the house of my dreams. I drive my dream sports car. I have wonderful people in my life. I'm on the water. I wake up every morning when I finish sleeping. <laughs> I watch the sailboats bobbing in the bay. I get my herbal tea. I kind of ease into my day. I don't have any place I have to go, anything I have to do. I've got the lifestyle of my dreams. I've been very, very blessed. I also understand that with that, all those blessings, comes responsibility. We've got to pay back. We've got to share what we know. What I know is network marketing is the only thing that was going to take that guy from the pancake house on Midville Boulevard and put me where I am today. 
wasn't going to happen in the restaurant business. It wasn't going to happen uh, in the hairstyling business. It wasn't going to happen in the magazine business. IBM, AT&T, they weren't recruiting me, okay? They weren't calling me, offering me executive vice president jobs with corner offices and stock options. It wasn't happening. only way I got where I am is because of this business we're talking about here tonight. And what kept me in that business, years after I got money, was people like David and Roberta who were uh, up, the, up the highway from me about an hour and 15 minutes. I used to have to drive. Just I wait a rush hour was almost over, but there's still a little rush because I had to leave early enough to be at their house to do meetings. Now, why did I do that when I don't have to? I did that because here were two people with four kids. He was an engineer making a horrible income trying to raise four kids with that, but they had a dream. See, I would go anywhere for someone with a dream. My friend in Arizona who was the single mother with the kids in the basement who got her life back, got her freedom back. I got Jeannie and Will in Nashville and I have people in I've got people in every state of the country that are building their dreams. Just like you guys here tonight. You know, you could be doing what everyone else in the world is doing tonight, just sitting in front of the idiot box watching mindless sitcoms made for third graders. Sitting in a bar drinking somewhere, you know, out in nightclubs. You know, this is what most people are doing tonight. You came here tonight, or you're listening to this tape because you said, Hey, I want more out of life, or I've got that divine dissatisfaction. So do me a favor. Please think back. If, if you doubled or tripled the income you're making right now, if you quadrupled it, and people do that routinely in this business, could you buy any of those five things that you do have or become if money was no object? Do me a favor, please. I want you to get with the person who invited you here tonight, or I want you to get with the person who gave you this tape. Let them take you to some kind of function, some kind of get-together, some place where people get together, and they can tell you about their company, and they can tell you about their products. And how you can take those products and put them into this distribution revolution and capitalize on all these trends we're talking about here tonight. You've got to check out. You, you can't, you know, there's nothing here you can buy tonight. There's nothing you can sign tonight. It isn't about that. I'm only here to say, hey, please, wake up. Get out of the rat race. Stop nibbling cheese. Stop listening to your deadbeat victim friends. Stop listening to the media, the TV, the radio, the newspaper will tell you all the reasons why you can't make it and how you ought to stick with that 45-year plan for that life of quiet desperation. I escaped the matrix. <laughs> yeah, I got out. And there's people, some of you all listening, you need to get out of that rat race. And others, like I say, you've got a great job. You're winning the rat race but you're living like a rat. <laughs> and you want to get out of there. This business can give you that opportunity. If I could tell you just one thing, it would be, please remember when you were the age of those kids that we talked about. And what were the dreams that you had then? Are you willing, really willing, to go back and give those dreams life again? Because if you are, this business can bring those dreams to life. Thank you very much.